This is the opening of the Key Allegro exhibit. Um, we have a lot of people to thank for getting this exhibit together and to uh, and for the program tonight. Uh, Leo Leva, Maureen Weekelman, um, Vicki Merchant, Pam Shanahan, and of course Carla. Uh, they all worked really hard getting the uh, exhibit together. Uh, at this point, I want to turn the program on over to uh, Carla, and uh, she's going to introduce the speakers for tonight and, um, and start the program. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. It really means a lot to have you here, that you're all so interested in Key Allegro history. This is amazing. Uh, the bulk of the exhibit came from my mother's <coughs> collection of photos and scrapbooks, and, uh, but, but the volunteers at the History Center put it all together. They worked extremely hard to turn it into a story. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, the, the exhibits are free, so remember when you visit to drop a donation in the box. It really helps put together the exhibits for us. Um, I'd like to, th these are my speakers tonight. I've got Jerry Brundrat, who is the Aransas County Surveyor, and I've got Parky Luce, Parky Ledbetter Luce. She is the daughter of Jerry Ledbetter, who was the fir one of the very first salesmen, one of my dad's first sales agents at Key Allegra Development and Sales. And her husband, Dane Luce, who is uh, owner, the owner and operator of Luce Properties. I also have um, some, well, I haven't seen some of the people I was looking for tonight. Uh, Fran Leith Pontash is here. Her father, Ken Leith, was uh, the second owner of the Key Allegro Marina. He bought it from my dad in 1969. Fran, raise your hand. <laughs> and... Uh, Sandy Little Pfeiffer, I don't know if she's here, but her father, Port Little, was one of the early builders of Key Allegro. Um, Kathy Allgood Rinchy was uh, one of our beloved vocalists, the beloved vocalist of the Key Allegro Yacht Club for over 20 years, so I'm really happy to have her here. <clears throat> Life's a holiday, for a weekend or a lifetime. These were catchphrases that my father used in the marketing of Key Allegro. My father was Carl Kruger Jr. And they were very effective for advertising the development, but they were also a kind of a life motto that he lived by. He was just a fun-loving guy and he really believed that life is a holiday. My father, Carl Kruger Jr., was born and grew up as a privileged, precocious only child in San Antonio, the son of Carl and Patricia Kruger. To say he was spoiled is kind of an understatement. Uh, as a child, he, he started a, a neighborhood newspaper called the Lowood News, and we have copies of this newspaper in the exhibit in a notebook that's pretty interesting to read. The newspaper had editorials, cartoons, jokes, and he typed them on one of those giant Smith Corona typewriters. I saw that at my grandmother's house one time and sold them for two cents a copy and distributed them with the help of his five cousins and buddies in the neighborhood who made up a staff of co-editor and reporters for this little newspaper. He was also the editor and the cartoonist for his high school newsletter letter and an anonymous composer of an underground rag that he produced when he was uh, on a Navy ship that he slipped underneath the doors. And I mention all this just as a testament to his, his uh, intelligence, his love of journalism, his ambition, and his entrepreneurial skills that really served him well later on. He had a wicked sense of humor, and he loved to write letters. Some of them as jokes, some of them really serious. A lot of them letters to the editor with a specific agenda in mind. And some of you in the audience may have been recipients of these letters. <laughs> so he graduated high school from TMI, Texas Military Institute in San Antonio. And uh, then he enlisted briefly in the Navy. He attended Texas A&M University and graduated from the University of Missouri with his degree in journalism. He met and married my mother, Patricia Davis. They started their family, me and my younger sister, Linda, an overweight beagle and a Siamese cat. 
<laughs> he was working for the family business, Samsco, San Antonio Machine and Supply Company, as a, a salesman, the marketing director, and the vice president when the business was sold, and he found himself unemployed. So having vacationed in coastal areas, he and my mom went to Fort Lauderdale and got the idea that Texas was ripe for canal front subdivisions like they have there. After a stay in Port Aransas, they ventured up the Texas coast and kind of came upon Rockport and found a 237-acre peninsula called Frandelig Peninsula that was for sale by the Aransas County Navigation District. He got together a group of eight investors and they purchased the island for $65,000 in 1961. That's when the work began. The first sales office was a 25-foot Chris Craft that was moored in the freshly dredged canals with a welcome aboard sign stuck in the sand. My mother recalled constantly sweeping sand off the deck of that boat. <laughs> They had pretty drawings and some dream, uh, pretty drawings of the dream island, but quickly learned that it was just going to be impossible to sell. The island was too primitive at that time. It was just piles of sand. So we went on back to Florida and enlisted the help of some expert builders of bulkheads to get the canal systems started. My father teamed up with Vicki Merchant's father, Chuck Vermillion, on a handshake to do all the dredging of the canals. We built one of the first homes on Key Allegro on Bayshore on the Bay side. And after spending one summer here, this was gonna be our second home. I was registered to go to first grade in San Antonio. We spent the summer here and my father asked me if I would like to move there permanently. And I was all into that deal. That was great. My sister and I had a dream childhood, uh, spending our summers barefoot, Beach combing, swimming in the bays or canals. My grandfather bought us a brown and white pinto pony, Shetland pony named Baby. And we kept it in a little chain link fence enclosure on the island near the bridge where the yacht club is now. There was uh, also a metal portable building there that was the office for the building supervisor who went out and lit the tiki torches on the bridge every night. The island social scene was Friday night at the Key Allegro Marina with 25 cent beer and the kids spent the time in, in the boat barns, the covered boat barns with cane poles fishing for piggy perch and sheep's head. <laughs> the Islander Club, which was built by Harry Cole, was, uh, the, uh, the club was upstairs over the restaurant. And uh, that was our fine dining. That was the time to dress up. That, that club had a bar with a fabulous deck overlooking Little Bay. It had a dance floor, a piano, a jukebox featuring Patsy Cline and Elvis. And I learned to dance, I learned to waltz standing on top of my grandfather's shoes there. The island was not an overnight success by any means. My father really honed his marketing skills and enlisted plenty of professional help and even tried a few gimmicks. There was an essay contest that the San Antonio Express News featured uh, and in the, the contest was write why you want to spend a weekend on an island. And this was done in conjunction with the airing of the movie Beach Party, which featured Annette Funicello and, and Frankie Avalon. The winner received a weekend at the Key Allegro Motel. One day a man drove up to the marina with a bottlenose dolphin in the back of his uh, station wagon. Then the dolphin needed water and food desperately. So my dad got together with some guys and they quickly fashioned a couple of pins with chicken wire around the boat slips there at the gas dock. And we had an exciting dolphin show for a brief time. Um, the crowds were hard to control. The neighbors complained about it and it turned out to be a dismal financial failure. And my father kind of convinced the dolphin trainer that he needed to take those dolphins over to Port Aransas and have a show there. And that show inspired a novel by Stephen Harrigan titled Aransas. There's a copy of it in the, in the exhibit. 
There were numerous professional photo shoots with models from Corpus Christi, most notably a young unknown named Farrah Fawcett. My mother, who was beautiful and very photogenic, got in on the action of those photo sessions too. She was featured in a lot of ads, while my camera shy father could sometimes be spotted in the distance of a photo at the helm of the Key Allegro 2 or 3 or 4. And these boats were dad's best sales tools. He usually purchased them with a partner, but he admitted that that was a true test of their relationship. Pro prospective buyers um, were treated to duck and goose hunts, uh, fishing trips and sunset cruises, canal cruising cocktail parties, and literally shown lots for sale from the water. My mother was the perfect host, chef, and partner to the entertainment side of the business. Dad often walked in at 5 o'clock and announced that he was bringing new clients or new friends over for dinner, and she, she rarely complained. He loved to entertain because he had a beautiful, exciting development to show off. He was understandably very proud of it. Um, the parties, oh, he was understandably very proud of it. And our home was often visited by artists and writers and CEOs of large companies. One time he had, a, he thought he had a potato chip salesman coming to visit. And it turned out to be John Williamson, who was the CEO and president of Frito-Lay. <laughs> so the parties were an integral part of selling the small town friendly island lifestyle. My dad lamented that he wasn't that good a salesman because too often the prospects or new friends would go back to San Antonio or Houston after the weekend, sober up, and forget about buying. <laughs> But that was only for a while. They usually came back for a weekend or a lifetime, because life's a holiday. Hmm. So I was only six years old when we moved here, and my memories are a little selective about that. But uh, Jerry was a little older. Maybe he remembers <laughs> different things. <laughs> Jerry, what do you remember? Oh, I'm going to stand up, because I sat down in this chair, and it sunk about three feet in the ground. It's not my weight, it's got to be the ground. You know, I, I don't know, there's a lot of people here tonight that, uh, like me, raised in Rockport and have fond memories of Fond League Island, fond memories of the development of Kill Agro, but I had the pleasure of working for uh, Mr. Kruger, for Carl, uh, at the marina, and, and they were just finishing the marina. And when I started working there for him, uh, my job was to go over to the motel, which is over where the restaurant, the little uh, tip of the, of the turnaround there, it was a, a motel and a restaurant, and I was to wash all the windows, car windows, in the parking lot, and I would leave a little card underneath the, the windshield wiper that said, windows washed courtesy of Kill Agro Marina, come by and get gas, ice, you know, whatever, refreshments. And, and that was my job. And then I would go back to the marina, and I would work there. I would uh, fuel boats. I would um, put bait in the boats. And when they came in in the evening, I would clean them. I would clean their fish, whatever needed to be done. And I, I think I was spending about 12 hours a day at the marina and, and worked firsthand with all of these people. Uh, I think Carla was talking about uh, the maintenance man, Mr. Turk. I don't know how many of y'all remember Mr. Turk, but he came down with uh, Carl from San Antonio, and he operated the water system. They didn't have a city water system out there. They had a, a water tank generally where the uh, restaurant is today uh, and the Kilago Real Estate, and they had a well, and they would fill the tank. It probably wasn't very good water. Uh, Libby probably remembers if it was good water or not, but... Uh, that was the water system. The, the island was on septic tanks. Uh, but I do have some other stories. Uh, I go back to, I think, probably uh, 62, 63. Uh, all the young guys in town, for some reason, we thought it was cool to go out there and kill rattlesnakes, cut the rattlers off, put them in a mason jar, and then we would take them to school to try to impress the girls. Well, as soon as we cracked the lid on that mason jar, 
and the odor got out, it, it was not, the girls were not impressed. <laughs> so we gave up on that theory. But, you know, I ate my first uh, cactus apple on Kilagro. We would camp out there. We would eat the, uh, you know, the cactus uh, leaf, uh, take the thorns off, and we'd cook them over a fire, and, and we thought that was good. Uh, we would fish out there, and I was talking with David Pickton, and he talked about getting a, you know, getting a jeep stuck out there in, in the marsh. But the island developed in five different phases. So unit one was pretty well dredged, and then it went to two, three, and four. Every unit of Kilegro, the channels got a little wider, and the ground got a little higher. So unit one was probably the lowest, and by the time they got to unit five, it was a little bit higher. Another interesting story, since my wife's not here, I can tell this one. Um, we used to go parking out there. She was, uh, came here her sophomore year in high school, and uh, she was from Oklahoma, and then a little while in San Antonio. So I convinced her that we could go out there and watch the submarine races. I don't know how many of y'all, but, you know, she was very gullible, so we went out there, and we would park to watch the submarine races. And we wouldn't be there very long, and Buddy McLester, <laughs> Captain McLester, Buddy was the uh, night watchman, or he was the watchman. So he would come with his flashlight, you know, and be shining in the window. So we soon learned that that was not a good thing to do, so we had to move on. <laughs> but we still watch submarine races other places. Um, the dolphins, uh, Carla mentioned the dolphins. I worked at the marina that summer that... Uh, the people with the dolphins came down and actually what they were doing they were trying to not only train dolphins but they were trying to capture a uh, bottlenose dolphin in Aransas and Copano Bay they were plentiful and they wanted to train them and then they would put them in the different Sierrama and those type of shows so my job was to at the marina was to thaw out uh, the fish food it came in frozen uh, and I don't remember it was uh, mackerel, herring, or what it was, maybe two different kinds, but we would have to defrost them uh, with tap water, put them in a bucket, and then twice a day we would have to feed them. And I would go out there and feed them. I got to swim with the dolphins, um, and then they would, as Carla said, they would have these shows where the dolphin trainers would get them to jump and do flips and things. All I did was swim with them and, and feed them. Uh, it was a great, exciting time in my life. I met a lot of great people, and I, and I had the pleasure of knowing Carl uh, the rest of his life till he died. He was a man of vision. Um, you know, I could, I could sit and talk with him, and later on, uh, before he passed away, he would call me sometime and, and ask me to come to his office and just sit and talk with him, and he would tell me stuff. And, and uh, I was always amazed. I sat there with my mouth open because he was always looking to the future. And, and when you look at a community, there's always turning points in the evolution of that community. Kill Egro was that turning point in that period of time. We went from a, a cattle uh, shipping type to more of a, a fishing tourism. And then we went into a residential channel development type. Uh, community, but that was a turning point, and we've been blessed in this community because of the people that have come in to to stay in Kilagro and Harbor Oaks and all these other and uh, great people, which has made this community what it is today. And um, that's pretty much it. I could probably tell more, but I I was told to sort of censure my stories a little bit because I could really tell you some good ones. <laughs> anyway, I here you go, Carla. Marky, let's, let's hear your story. Alrighty. As Carla said, Jerry Ledbetter is my dad, and uh, it was pretty exciting for us, too. Yes, and my mom, Libby Ledbetter, is here in the audience now. Um, but as we came to, uh, to Kill Agro, my dad was a sales agent and broker for Carl. And one of my dad's visions was for more people, just like Carl, to come and enjoy this wonderful place on the coast. Um, our family moved into 13 Riviera, which was, if you pull straight through the office parking lot, there was our house, and it overlooked the Little Bay. So we could see the Kilago Bridge and the Fulton Beach Road. Uh, it was a community of friends, all islanders, and getting together, as Carla said, they would get together on the weekend, and those of us fortunate 
to live on the island full time, we would get together for potluck dinners during the week. And it was just a community of friends and islanders. And as she mentioned, the torches on the bridge were so thrilling, and then it changed to gas lights. Um, the pool had a slide, which was a, a unique feature in this area, it seemed like. And then we also had the diving board, and Carol Crawford taught swimming lessons. And long before, uh, back in the days of copper tone, she wore something else, but it was like smeared white all over her face and stuff, and would wear long white shirts because she was protecting her skin from the sun. But she had to convince the kids first it was okay to go in the water with her. Uh, <laughs> It turned out that I became the lifeguard at the pool in the summertime also, and it was a lot of fun uh, just seeing the different islanders and friends that were on the community and friends of ours that were on the community. The Key Allegro Garden Club was started, and it beautified the park as you came into Key Allegro, and they were also very instrumental in getting the fountain put on the entrance park. And I don't, you know, there were a few times during the year that people would throw uh, soap in it, and the suds were going everywhere. <clears throat> no, it was not me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Electoral Women's Garden Club, uh, they uh, started the annual rummage sale, and this was to raise money for the annual scholarships that were given to Rockport Fulton graduates. And then they also started the directory, and this was to help the Islanders as friends to be able to get in touch with each other with their permanent address if they didn't live here and phone number. Uh, these two clubs also coordinated each year at Christmas time and I was able to participate in some of these events uh, later on but we would wrap uh, the signpost on the island with decorations and then move to the entrance park and put up a Christmas tree and wrap the palm trees and then the year that I got assigned of standing on the bridge to wrap some of those gas lights it, it was a little scary up there. <laughs> um, in August 1970, August 3rd, that's when Hurricane Celia was coming. And so we had a lot of second home owners that were here. So our family and others on Key Allegro uh, banded up together and we went and pulled in furniture, anything that we could pull in so it didn't blow. And uh, as it turned out, we stayed at the Sand Dollar Hotel and I didn't hear until about a year ago, Carla was saying that she stayed upstairs there. Our family stayed downstairs, and my siblings and I were a little disappointed because we wanted to be able to see the action until the center of the storm and the, the eye came over, and it was very still, and most of the upstairs was gone. And we were downstairs at that time, and then as we came back, uh, the bridge was not, they told us we couldn't travel over the bridge, so we would go from the Fulton Beach Road, leave our car there, and travel by a John boat over to our house on Riviera. Um, as Carla said, the vision, and Jerry mentioned that the vision kept growing because the Key Allegro condos were built in the early 70s, then the Allegro North condos from there. Uh, Bill Christian was the main builder, and he was the one that owned the little John boat that we borrowed right after the storm. Uh, in the early 80s, there were the Bay House condominiums, but it just kept spreading, and more and more people came to enjoy Key Allegro and the friendly area that it is. Thanks, Parking. Hey, tell us what you know. <laughs> <laughs> Carla sw uh, swore me to secrecy that, or, that, that, I, that I would only tell clean stories, and, and that's my nature anyway. I'm, I'm Dane Luce. Uh, both, uh, everybody that spoke before me paid homage to my sweet dear mother-in-law, Libby Ledbetter. She came in just a few minutes ago and luckily found a nice, comfortable chair. Uh, Jerry, Carla mentioned Jerry is the first broker salesman on the island. And, uh, he couldn't be with us tonight, but Libby is, is here. I got a cheat sheet. Um, I really don't belong in this crowd. I can't figure it out. These people have been here all their lives. <laughs> I've been here a mere 40 years, which is all my grown-up life. Um, so I, I, I take pride in that, uh, sinful pride in that. But ever <laughs> since I could pick a place that I wanted to live, it's been Rockport, Texas. Uh, I'm going to scoot on a little bit. Carla and I agree. Probably my contribution to any conversation about Key Allegro in the way back would be my uh, acquaintanceship with her dad. Uh, when I moved here in the late 70s, my dad had moved here a couple of years earlier with, the, of course, my mom and grandma and siblings. Anyway, he was uh, 
kind of a hustler on his own part. And he sent out a letter to uh, quite a few. I don't know how many people, but most of them had boats in the Key Allegra Marina. And his expertise, retired Navy guy, merchant marine guy, radio operator, he uh, made an offer for 200 bucks a month. I'll take care of your boat, wash it, clean it, run the motors, because he recognized that the time that you don't use a boat is what wears it out. It's not the time that you use it. Sort of like a girlfriend. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's what he used to say. And uh, of, the, of the number of folks that, that responded to his letter, Carl was one of them. What I didn't know when my dad sent that letter out was that I was going to be the lackey doing the cleaning on these boats. <laughs> but he did agree to split the 200 with me, and I had barely moved here, and kids were coming on. So, I mean, literally coming you know, into the world. So I was happy to do it. It only took a couple of years. My dad and I split in that job. My dad had a new boat of his own. He said, son, I'm going to turn you over on these boats, one of them being Carl's, the Key Allegro 3, 43-foot Viking sport fisherman. Carl's and my interaction would be generally this time of day he would call me, not every day, but once a week at least, and raise hell because he hadn't seen that boat go out of the Leggett Lights. You remember where I live? Uh, he would remind me where he lived, and he would he wanted me to have the delusional thought that he could he knew every time that boat left. Well, it only took me a short while to interpret that as just use the boat. Well, how you know I was in my early twenties. How difficult is that? Take the boat out, man. So uh, it was it was very interesting. I had to clean it and run it, uh, but it basically was pretty much uh, at my disposal, and uh, that went on for a number of years, and. The uh, probably I could tell no more than I knew about Mr. Kruger because I had no other connection with Key Allegro at the time. But I could tell that I don't want to use the word quality, but that's the only word I know. I'm not educated very well of his house, of his guests. If they were super close, well, let me start the other end. If they weren't too close, I never heard about them. If they were medium close, they'd stay on the boat at the Key Allegro Marina under the A-shed. I got some guests. Make sure that boat's looking good. If they were <laughs> medium close, he'd have me move the boat behind the house on Finisterre, and they would stay in the boat behind the house. If they were super close, they would stay in the house on Finisterre, but he still wanted the boat behind the house because it looked pretty cool to have this beautiful <laughs> boat back there. And I, it, I would be remiss if I didn't say, uh, I was over there doing some waxing on the Key Allegro 3, and I guess Carla was home, Linda, Carla, and some other young lady that I didn't know. Of course, I was the white trash working on the boat, but these beautiful young ladies were behind the house sunbathing. Well, I don't have to tell you guys, the outside, the sear side of that boat, in that boat slip, got a lot of wax. <laughs> where, I was, where I was able to enjoy the view. Carla told, and I kept it clean. No interaction, I promise you, because I was, like I said, I was just the hired help. But the, uh, I, I, and I don't want to take a joyful occasion like this and, and tell a sad story, but I am going to tell you one sad story. Carl called me. It's sad on very many levels. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to sell the boat. He said, I'm, I'm going to ask you if you'll take this fella out. He was a car dealer from Bay City, Texas. I want you to take the guy out, run the boat. If he wants to go to Port A, whatever he wants to do. Yes, sir, Mr. Kruger. We had a very, apparently a very successful ride. The guy was happy. A couple of weeks later, Carl calls me back. That guy wants to come back. I think he's going to buy the boat. Well, you can see why that's sad on one level for me. Anyway, I said, yes, sir, Mr. Kruger. He wants to bring some family. We go out again. Not quite as long of a cruise, the second one. We come back in, tie the boat up, they disappear. Carl calls me and says, get all my personal stuff off the boat. The guy bought the boat. He said, but I'm going to send you a little bonus. Well, that took some of the sadness out of it, but it's still a horribly sad story. I got my next check from Carl. The boat was long gone. There was an extra $50. <laughs> Just brings a tear to your eye, doesn't it? <laughs> One of, one of my favorite <laughs> memories about the, about the boat, the Key Allegro 3, though, is one time Carl called me and said, I got an important customer, prospect, prospect coming. I want you to go around town 
and get every cassette. CDs weren't heard of. Every cassette you can find with Ray Price. Well, there was, there wasn't a Walmart, first one or the second one. I think we had wins. They didn't sell. Anyway, I went to Francis Pass, Port Aransas, I mean, a, a, a Portland. I hustled up a couple, and he said, now open them up. Make them look like they've been used a while. <laughs> so, and, and uh, so I had them on the boat for Mr. Price. Well, I thought that was a cool story. I didn't know Parky yet. And when I told her that story, when we were courting, she said, oh, yes, he came in the office. He introduced himself. My name's Ray. So my story didn't hold very much water with my, my sweet little wife, but one thing, I think where I got more uh, uh, closer, pardon me, grammatically correct, uh, one place I got closer with Carl, long after the boat was gone and I had gone, gotten into the real estate business, Carl and I agreed on a number of things, but we agreed on one thing very specifically, and that was that bar patrons need real estate representation just like anybody else <laughs> and uh, Carl was gracious to a young uh, boat scrubbing idiot when I'd run into him with her, wherever on his when he was running his traps wherever I might run into him is always sit down here he'd always compliment me on my shirt because I kept them pretty pressed but uh, it was in that scenario I guess over those years maybe the last 20 or so before Carl passed that I got uh, he would introduce me to his other buddies Harry Cole uh, the the calling card he gave Harry when Harry opened Allegro Liquors in his retirement identified Harry not as the owner of the liquor store but as the chief product evaluator <laughs> <laughs> uh, Roy Hicks and the others so uh, it's fun to talk about that, but when we think from a very real gut level point, the subdivision, Key Allegro, I can remember working with Libby and Jerry over the years. I would hear Jerry say, well, and Jerry don't say much. You, I mean, you got to work to get some syllables out of Mr. Ledbetter. <laughs> but he would say, you know, this little old subdivision represents probably about 35 percent of the tax base for the city of Rockford. And I wanted to verify that before I told you that tonight. Uh, and I talked to Mike Soto. And he was extremely uh, uh, informative and did an extensive study. Used a half a ream of papers printed this morning. I, I, I promise you. Even with all the disrepair that Key Allegra was in, the, condominiums that can't be used and homes that have been whacked and the empty lots it still represents to this day and there's some commercial property missing on the report it still represents right at 25 percent of the the tax base so i i take great pleasure in that because we're we're doing something you know that's a lot of school teachers a lot of police officers a lot of ambulance drivers anyway i again i feel very honored and carla thank you for including me thank you Dave. Thank you all for coming and, and sharing your stories and thank you all for coming and uh